Well, hello, I'm, uh, my name is Rick Schrader. I'm a hostaholic. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't gotten a hosta for four months. That's right. We got, we got 12 of them back in September, and they're resting out in the yard right now, dug in and waiting for winter to be over. Of course, we're also growing seedlings um, in the upstairs room adjacent to the bedroom, so we have uh, four or five hundred seedlings now coming up, and they're all up about three or four inches right now. So, oh my, God. We, my wife is the hybridizer and the one that gives me the seeds, and I plant them. So that's how we get started. This uh, tonight, if you have questions as I'm going through, uh, raise your hand. Uh, we are we are taping this also. Uh, so, like I said, we'll do questions as we go, and I will have questions and answers at the end. So what perennial will we probably not find at this garden? <laughs> well, they probably won't let me put a hosta out there, but Again, we all, all of us that work at the Idea Garden know it's basically a sun garden. There's some shaded areas. Uh, hostas don't do real well in full sun uh, all the time. And this is the hosta garden down in the Arboretum, and we don't plant annuals down there. So we all, move, we all have the annuals at the Idea Garden. And down here we do have companion plants, but we don't plant any annuals in this area. This is some of, the, some of the books that we use laying up on the front here. This is uh, the one in the middle, the Hostopedia. This is, this is the pocket guide, <laughs> pocket guide to hostas, so um, weighs about 30 pounds. And we have some books up here that when we, uh, after the meeting, you're welcome to come up and look at them. Um, we use these extensively for uh, trying to identify hostas in some of the yards. We've had, on some of the gardens walks, Barbara and I have gone out and tried to identify some of the hostas that people have. So full shade, morning sun, uh, afternoon sun, these are important factors that you really have to look at your yard if you have shade. Uh, how many of you here have just really just a sun garden? You have very little shade. Okay, we're gonna have some, I'll have some things here that you'll still be able to grow hostas, and I'll show you how you can do that even though you have a sun yard. This is part of our front yard, it gets a morning sun. You can grow a, a lot of hostas. The photo on the right is in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia. Uh, it's a, about a 10 acre garden. The house sits up on the hill. There's a lake at the bottom. They have some 10,000 hostas on the hillside that they use as ground cover. And you notice the sweep of darker green up through the lighter green. That's the way they planned it. And so even though we don't have some of those areas like that here in, in Champaign, you may have some kind of a hillside that is when trees and you've had trouble growing anything else, think about growing hostas under it. Uh, they do like it under certain trees, others they don't. On the left-hand side, uh, is not the kind that we prefer. It's a bunch of minis with a lot of rocks. Uh, and, but a gardener in Chicago was nothing, he's a hosta collector, had some thousand hostas in his yard, did not have a single companion plant. So we go from uh, companion plants to, to none at all. These are some of the trees and shrubs that we probably all have uh, in, our, in our yard. And you can see the ones on the left side, hickories, lindens, Japanese maples are certainly good to grow hostas under. On the right hand side, if you have maple trees, like we have a couple of maples in our backyard, they are next to impossible to grow a hosta under, so we do it in pots and I'll show you some of that. Hosta sizes. There's a lot of discussion. People ask us about the different sizes. If you have a big yard, I mean, we have a, we have a normal size lot. If you have a nice big yard, you can go to all the big hostas. They get three, four, five feet across. Uh, minis, you see the blue mousers up there. We have two hostas up on the table here that are, are small. 
Um, they won't get a whole lot bigger than that. They're going to give those away tonight to a couple people. Uh, that's the small range. You see the 12 to 15 inches. A medium is 15 to 24. A large 30 and an extra large will get just will get up to 36 and above. And if you any of you have heard of Empress Wu, that's one of the largest hostas right now. That uh, and ours. Ours is up about three feet tall and about four or five feet across already in three years. So it's a good, fast growing hosta. But again, you need the room for it. Um, we try and do the more of the small and the medium hostas because we don't have, oh, we have a small yard. So you have to look at what size yard do you have. Hosta colors. <clears throat> you use blues in the, in the shade. The warm colors are yellows and gold. Variegated, you can see they do well in the back. They seem to bring a garden forward. Um, and and we, we try to mix the various colors along with the companion plants of either similar or contrasting. Fragrant hostas, there's a Plantagenia and family and fossas, hostas that have come from the Plantagenia family are generally fragrant, and they'll have a very large white flower. And so if you plant those around your deck, uh, certain times of the day, you can, you can get that nice smell from, from uh, the hosta. The worst sun uh, for a hosta is between 11 and, and 4 in the daytime. We have lost a tree uh, in our backyard, so everything that was under the tree is now a shade plant that's going to get moved someplace else, and some of those that are more uh, adaptable to the sun will get moved into that area. They lose their, their moisture from sun and wind. Hostas need at least an inch of water every week. Um, they prefer to get watered not on the leaves, but in, at the ground level, as we always try and water all of our plants. And again, by the time July and August rolls around, uh, I think everybody has a hosta garden. Uh, you find they're beginning to look pretty bad. Um, depending on how much you water, if you give them a lot of water, they will do pretty well. Um, but by the, by the late summer, uh, they usually suffer. So here's, you have, a, you have a handout that we gave you, which is on our uh, Hostas Society website. But here are some of the hostas that, that we'll do that are tolerant to a full sun. And, and by a full sun, I mean anywhere from three to five hours. Uh, sun power is a good one. And you see some of the others listed there. Again, the, the Planogenia, Aphrodite is one, but the Planogenia will take a lot of sun, some in substance. If any of you have that in your yard, that's, that's a very sun-loving plant. Uh, ours, we're going to have to move it. I've got it, it's in too much shade now. It's one of the things you plant a plant, and you find out that the trees grow, and it becomes in shade, and now I've got to find another place for it. It will go in the backyard. Here's some that can handle all four hours. And you'll notice as dawn's early light, it's, it's a beautiful, bright yellow hosta in the spring. But as the summer goes on, it turns green, turns a light green. Some hostas will hold their color of yellow through the whole season. Some of them will turn green as they go along. So if you planned on this beautiful yellow hosta for the whole year, uh, you find out by, by late June, uh, you have a green hosta, but it, uh, it will be light green. Some of the you can go online, but like our hostopedia over here, you can you can find that information on a lot of them. And then here's ones that want shade. A blue hosta, the reason it's blue, it has a wax. It has a thick coating of a wax on it that that gives it that blue cast. This is the one called Silver Bay. A uh, friend of ours up in Minnesota hybridized that hosta, brought it on the market. Uh, that was take a picture taken in his backyard after a rain. Ours looked like that this year until the tree died and the sun came out and it turned green. 
So next year, uh, next spring, it's going to get moved to a shadier place, so I will still have the blue hosta. Get into a design area. In 2009, we rebuilt the deck on our house. And so I designed the deck to allow, um, allow planting areas. There's, there's one on each side. We got these large red pots. Those hostas have been in those pots, and these two have been in them now for six years, since 2009. Uh, I left this little corner out here, knowing I'd put some kind of a pot out there. So if you have a deck and you're going to do a rebuild on your deck, look for areas to not only put pots for hostas, but for other plants. And that's just part of your, of your looking ahead of how to design something. Rick, did you take those red ones inside during the winter? Uh, no, they end up sitting right where those two chairs are. I put all four of them together. I have, uh, the question was, do they go inside? Uh, they sit right there. I, I put insulation, bad insulation around them. Uh, I put a milk carton on top in the middle. I cover them with frost cloth so the water drains off and they sit there all winter. In the spring, by about the first part of March, I, I take that off and look at them and by the middle of March, they're starting to come up. I pick them up and put them back on the deck. Uh, one of them has been changed out, one that was on the other side over here. It's got a new hosta in it. Uh, and I'll show you a few more pots, but hostas do love to grow in pots. They really do. These are some friends of ours down in the St. Louis area. They had a large concrete deck, and Harley built these two planters, and he's got minis and smalls in it. Now, his only problem is this is about a noontime picture, and you see the sun. He's got this hot noontime sun. But by about 1 or 1.30 in the afternoon, that, that garden goes into shade. So if you have a large deck and you do have a shaded area, it makes a great place to come in and build some raised beds. And especially as a few of us are getting older, not everybody in this room, of course, <laughs> having a raised bed helps in, in taking care of your plants. So you, you gain two things. You get a planting area. You, you break up this big... Um, expansive concrete, but you also get something raised that makes it much easier for gardening. This is another garden in the St. Louis area. Uh, they had been in the process of uh, rebuilding their deck, and so they, they kept all the timbers that were supporting the deck, made these frameworks, and put hyphatufas up on top. Uh, we saw this idea at, at the garden in St. Louis, came home when we redid our deck. I kept the four by four posts. I made the brackets. We made the hypertufa pots and we have two of them sitting in front of our fence. And you can see the one thing it's done, it's broken up that long big wall. Uh, it's difficult with the very small planting area they had, the driveway and everything. There's actually a driveway on this side that's uh, in behind this other photo. Um, they had an area that they said they had nothing that they could do to get rid of that wall. And uh, they don't have a lot of hosses in it, but there's some miniature conifers, ground covers, and everything else in there. So if you're getting ready to redo a deck and the contractor is cutting off your, your big posts, keep them. The one down at the bottom uh, is a friend of ours up in Minnesota. And you see all these different pots with both annuals, hostas, these were all sitting around, uh, this was prior to one of our conventions, Austin conventions in Minneapolis. He had these kind of scattered around his house. His daughter came out in the morning before the bus tour and put all these pots in one area. So you can see her eye <coughs> of, of getting all the various textures, the various colors, and then she broke up this big, this big wall that went all the way across part of the garden. This is a raised bed. His yard is about this level out here. And so she got rid of that wall that you would have seen uh, when you walked out. This is a garden up in Green Bay, Wisconsin area. The, the owners hauled in truckloads of a, of a concrete type stone and built this entire planting area. 
But you see what he's done? He's planted all these hostas along the front of it. And so the stone wall totally disappeared. So he still has the raised bed in the background in the trees. And he has plants and hostas back here that are raised up. But he eliminated the, the part of the, of the visual effect of this big concrete wall. So if you have a wall, uh, that's a good way to soften it and, and eliminate it. The view, winter time, you're going to see the wall, of course. This is in our backyard. Uh, I built this kind of this block wall not too long after we moved in for our raised bed. Barbara came in and planted all these minis. These are all minis along there. There was about six of them planted here when we first started. And they, they keep growing sideways until they have almost filled this wall up. So in effect, we eliminated the, the visual effect of this planting wall. And on the right-hand side, it's a little hard to see in this photo, there's a group of minis all on the walk. And again, that was an area that it, it takes your eye away from, uh, away from the walk. This is on the north side of our house in the shade. These are all, all hostas on this one side, various plants on the other side. So you can use them to hide uh, an area that maybe is not as appealing to, uh, to your eye or to the, your visitors. And of course, we all have to have a railroad liner out in our garden if you <laughs> like railroads. <laughs> this is the Better Homes and Garden uh, up in Des Moines, Iowa. And you can see what they've done in their hosta area. Nice curved walk, but they've, they've broken up the edge with, with the plantings. I'm wondering if the owner here today recognizes this in her yard. <laughs> this is in Margie's backyard. And you can see how she's, she's got a, a variety of different colors of hostas right along, the, along this edge, various companion plants. And if you've never been to her yard, you need to go. We use a lot of uh, companion plants, and if you, if you go out to our hosta garden out at the uh, Arboretum, uh, we've done the same thing out there. We mix a lot of companion plants in, be it, be it ferns, uh, pots. You can, you can see I've, I've got a blue pot. This is on a standard. There's a, a friend of ours in uh, Minneapolis that, that manufactures standards for pots in three vertical heights. And so we have five or six of those in our yard. Uh, we do have the information if you're available, some uh, interest in some. But this blue pot with a host in it is in front of the ferns. Um, I will tell you, that was purely by accident. I set the pot and everything out there before the fern came up. And um, we had, I think, one of our meetings, and somebody walked up to me and said, boy, you, I mean, you did that perfect. You got that blue pot and that host is right in front of this fern. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> So you see accidents do happen in, in how, you, how you lay out a garden. Uh, here we got uh, one of the hookers. Got a stilby in the back. Ivory coast here is, gives you a little bit different uh, well, a color and of course then the different textures. This is a, a hosta down in uh, Nashville area on one of our uh, hosta conventions. A little hard to see, but there's a waterfall up here, and here's the stream coming down to their uh, inlet area down here. But they have two hostas in pots sitting in the stream. And the hosta is Nutty Professor. Those of you that know Marianne Metz, uh, Marianne registered that hosta, and it's named after her husband, who was a professor at the university. So. Um, <laughs> You'll have to ask her why she used that name. <laughs> but again, if you have a, if you have a stream, um, they will draw up some water from the bottom. But look how they broke the stream up. You really don't see it. There's minis. There's a lot of minis growing in the rock areas. There's another pot, potted plant.
Um, I mentioned Silver Bay as a hosta from a friend of ours that's uh, up in Minneapolis area that hybridizes. This is his side yard. Don has about two acres of property that is nothing but hostas primarily. He hybridizes, uh, he grows thousands of seedlings every year. He picks out the ones that he thinks will go to market eventually. These guys always put them out in their, to grow in their areas in the back. And so these are, most of these he's told me are his hostas. Some have been named, some have not. But if you'll notice all the, look at all the different colors. Now this is in, this is in June, we were up there in June, and it's right after a rain. In fact, a hailstorm went through a half a mile north of their house uh, just before uh, our buster, the day before our buster, and he was forcing it. But he likes hostas, that's what he puts out there. But I always like this photo because it just gives you such a variety of colors that are available. When I was, I was talking about some larger hostas, the, the one on the left is called Roderick. Uh, we obtained this from a friend in Des Moines, Iowa. It's not really on the market right now. It's, uh, it's an older hosta. It was hybridized by uh, a gentleman in the Des Moines area. <coughs> and uh, we were fortunate that uh, a friend gave it to us. Uh, the one on the right, oops, wait, I went there. let's go back. The one on the right is Victory. That, that is about three years old. Stands about this tall. If you like a good upright hosta, that's a great hosta. Uh, and you get into some of the mediums and small ones. This is Carolina Sunshine. Uh, this was the hosta of the Rolla Convention about 10 years ago. And on the right is Quilting Bee. And we have that because my wife's a quilter, so we had to have Quilting Bee in the yard. So you can, you can get into using pots and areas to break up an area. The upper right is a, is a yard up in the Chicago area at one of our, one of our tour gardens. <clears throat> Notice how the pots wall up on stands. They, they break up that stone walkway. I mean, without that, you would have had a wagon wheel and a tree. And as a result, he's got, they have put out these planters. They raised them up so you can actually well, you can walk up and look at it. And they've added a lot of interest to that, to that walkway area. The same with the one on the bottom here, their, their walkways meandered through all their hosta beds and you can walk around it. This was all in a wooded area, but all their, all their beds, your walkways, you had no straight line uh, walkway area. The high patufas, uh, we did a class two or three years ago for the Master Gardener program up at Parkland, and uh, if you if you are available, if you if you have done those or you buy some, they're they're great pots to, to put hostas, small conifers, ground covers. They're great for setting out on your patio. This is in both of these are in Nashville area, uh, or excuse me, uh, North Carolina, but they they filled in the area of a patio. And there's a little bit of shade right here. This is kind of in the corner of a house. Uh, and that's why I'm saying if you have, if you have a corner uh, that gets either morning shade or afternoon shade, get some in pots. And I'll, I'll tell you how you then take care of those uh, through the winter. This is a, this is a hostile garden down in Memphis, Tennessee. Took old wheelbarrows. There's one. Can't really see that one. That's another one. He had ten of them in his yard, and he's drilled holes in the bottom. They have voles worse than we do. Uh, they have voles that just totally uh, ruin a garden. So everything they grow, they grow in the Memphis area is in pots. And he got tired of having uh, all these pots sitting around, so he started buying old wheelbarrows. 
and he wheels them off into his shed in the wintertime, and he wheels them back out in the spring. And uh, as long as they drain, they work. So if you got an old wheelbarrow at home, or you find an old one out at the idea garden that they're going to get rid of, <laughs> take it home, paint it yellow, and fill it, get enough drain holes, fill it full of a good, fill it full of a good potty mix, and plant some hostas and other plants in it. We've gotten into the minis. My wife, uh, this is this is Barbara's mousetrap. We have uh, one large pot that uh, she has. Those are all the mouse ears. That's blue mouse ears in the middle, and then all the sports that have come out of blue mouse ears. So she's a, she's a collector of those. Here's another set of, of minis that we have. They work real good in, in raised beds, in soil that uh, allows them to drain. The only issue you have to watch with minis is in the wintertime. Uh, they will want to heave because they have a very small root system. So we go back out. If we go out once we've had a lot of thaw, she'll walk around and look at all of our minis. And if you find the roots are up out of the ground, we'll push them back down in. And they, they will continue uh, to live. This is one way you can, you can do pots. I, I do a number of these. If you look down here, there is the black nursery pot. I put a couple of bricks in this large, in this large uh, pot, put a couple of bricks in the bottom so that the top of the black pot is slightly below the rim. I put mulch all the way around it and leave it in there. And, and then in the, in the fall, I take that pot out. And we have a storage area. If you have a, a, an unheated, totally unheated garage or a if you're lucky to have a potting shed, which we don't have, uh, you can store those in the potting shed over the winter. The other way to store uh, hostas is to take that pot, go to your compost pile, or go out in another place in your garden, dig a hole, set the pot down in the hole, tilt it uh, about 30 degrees so that the water can run off of it, and leave it all winter. And the hosta thinks he's in the ground for the wintertime. And in the spring, when he starts coming up, take him back and you put him back in the pot. This gives you an idea of how I do it. We, we purchased this pot uh, this summer. Um, we also purchased uh, this one, this, this hosta. This was a seedling that a friend of ours uh, hybridized in, uh, in Iowa. Uh, we purchased this at an auction. And so I... Instead of trying to put it in the ground, there I've, I've set it in there in the pot, putting the soil around it, and that's what it looks like afterwards. Did you say you put bricks underneath it? Well, I put I put something under it so that so I, I want the the top of the nursery pot to be at least an inch or two below the rim of the of the clay pot or whatever you're using, and we have clay or you can use, you know, any type, but you can't leave it down below. And then I put mulch around there so that when visitors come in and look at the garden, you don't, it looks like the hostas in the pot and not, you know, you don't see the black nursery pot. We have, I had uh, probably 25 of them this year that I had the black pot in the uh, clay or other type of planter, and then I put them in the back, yeah. How many years can they stay in the black nursery pot? Uh, it varies with a hosta. I'm going to show you one here that's only within within three months what it did. Normally, uh, normally you can go two or three years till it become totally root bound. But uh, this year I found uh, oh this. I'll show you another one here in just a little bit. This again is Nutty Professor. Uh, it's one that, that lays over. You can see how that hosta is laying over. Some do that. This is really the, uh, the best hosta for hanging over the side of a pot. We first got this one. Uh, I had it in the ground, and it had four or five leaves, and the next year it had one or two leaves, and the next year it had one leaf. And so I put it in the pots, and, and now it's, it's growing very well. But what this one needs is to hang over. And you'll find some of them when they say they're, if they're upright, 
they're, they're standing, all the, all, the, all the leaves are standing up good. Some houses want to tend to lay down, and um, that, that gets you into some other areas of some leaf rot. With different types of, of, of hyphatufa. This was made from a basket. This also came out of a out of a square, and then I I used a brush on the side to give it some uh, relief. These these are in ceiling in uh, chimney tiles. Uh, I'm originally from Danville, and Danville Tile Company uh, they have chimney tiles. This is back when when they built houses 60, 70, 80 years ago. This was the flue. And they had bunches of those left over. They're heavy, but, uh, uh, and these, I, this is not our yard, but in our yard, I actually leave them in the black nursery pot. This is the one I was gonna show you. This was, this was a hosta that we had in our plant sale called TNT Blue. It really is a nice blue hosta. I put it in this tall, this tall pot that we got, and I thought, boy, this would be nice. I put it back in the back part of the garden, and I got ready this fall to take it out. There's the root that had come out of the bottom of that pot. <laughs> it took me a half an hour to get that thing out of there. <laughs> now, this this hosta really grew. I mean, it's got it only had two crowns when I when I put it in there. It multiplied right away to three or four crowns. It rooted like that. So this is this one is an exception. It'll get put in the ground this year. It's not going back into another pot. <laughs> but you will find that they, they do pretty well. Once you get to the point that the hosta seems like it's not growing well, real well, in fact, I upsize. I mean, if, if I have one in a gallon pot and it's not doing well, I, I have a bigger clay pot to put it in and I will upsize a couple of times. Those ones in the red pots that you saw, they're planted, planted direct. They're right in with the root. And uh, when they finally get to the point that they don't want to grow well, uh, you start checking around and you find, like any plant we, we do, we, it's root bound. And they finally, they finally quit growing. Um, fertilizing is one thing. I mean, they, these guys get fertilizer uh, probably four or five times during the summer uh, to help them. So you get into companion plants. Uh, we all do that at the at the idea garden. I mean, there's, if you go out to the idea garden, you find a lot of great uh, sun companion plants. You'll see a lot of these. Hey, we have listed these are all a lot of good shade. Hookeras will do pretty well either location. Some of the newer hookeras will take a lot more sun, and so we do work them more toward the edge of the garden. Uh, but most of the other you see here is it is basically a shade area. Uh, we like to we like to put uh, other plants with our hostas. We think that different textures and colors uh, help. And you can see here some of this is some that I add just to get a little color. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, we've got we got a standard uh, conifer on a standard, a blue spruce on a standard area. There's a stilby. There's an annual. These are one of some of the few annuals that we'll put in. Uh, there's another one. Just gives you a little more color. Uh, I get I get tired of looking at I get tired of looking at the same hosta everywhere. <laughs> um, we, we like to use a few companions like him. <laughs> this, is, this is a hosta called Marilyn Monroe. And that's another great one. If you don't have it in your yard, uh, it's a good shade plant, but Marilyn Monroe is a, it's a great hosta. We use some driftwood. And the Kind of the big thing now, and we, we just attended our, uh, what we call uh, Midwest uh, Hosta Society Winter Conference up in Chicago, up in, in Naperville, uh, Saturday. And getting red right into hostas, into the, the scapes, into the leaves are where the, 
hybridizers are trying to go. They're trying to get away from the blue and the green and the yellow and start getting red up into the up into the hosta. And uh, oops, wrong button. <clears throat> this is called first blush. Came out of Bob Solberg down in North Carolina. And some of the photos of his hosta, this is ours that we, we bought, but the red is all the way up to this edge of the leaf. And on his photos and some of his, the red has come all the way up in the early, early part. If it gets a lot of sun, the red is up on the edge. And there's some that we've been seeing on the internet now on the Facebook pages that are getting red up into some of these veins. And so everybody's trying to get more red into a hosta because that's going to be the next big thing. This is red October. A lot, of, a lot of the hostas into the red series will have the red petioles. Called red October because it actually blooms in October. One of the latest blooming hostas you'll find. So this is this is kind of my formula for uh, how I do pots. I use a pine bark fine. You can get this, the only place around here is at a line IFS. It's a very small, uh, anywhere from half to three quarter inch uh, pieces of, uh, of pine bark. Uh, I use the, the uh, sphagnum peat. I put in a couple parts of potting soil. The, the, the bark <clears throat> is to allow for good drainage. Uh, I prefer vermiculite, you can use perlite. Uh, I use vermiculite because I, it's more gray. I'm not into the real white uh, stuff. And then you can add some controlled fertilizer. I, I put ours on top of it after I put them in the pots. And Mike Weber does a lot of micronutrients. Uh, we don't. Uh, that's that's kind of uh, one of the things you can add if you want to. <coughs> so for winter storage. Hostas generally need uh, 40 days at 40 degrees and below. So if you have a place that is fully unheated outside potting shed or a detached garage, you can take your pots, after everything's died back, take them inside, store them. You can put boards on top of the bigger ones, stack them up, and leave them in the garage. We have an attached garage. So right now, the temperature in the garage I looked at the other day, and it's down to 32. It's been around 40 degrees generally. We do have one pot on the back bench that I missed, and I looked at it three days ago before we went to Chicago, and the little guys are up about an inch. So it has come into the house because it's coming up too fast. Uh, you want to store them away from light. Uh, you want to store them preferably on a north wall because a south wall will draw heat. We store ours outside in two different areas on the ground. Um, we have an area that surrounds it. We push them all up together. I cover them up with uh, frost cloth. I, I take some uh, of the milk cartons, put them on top, put boards across, and then I make a tent out of the frost cloth. So in general, the rain and the water runs off. But they get they stay there all winter long. In the spring, by about the middle of March, I keep pulling that up and checking on them. Once they start to come up, I, I pull the frost cloth off, but I leave it there because you still have a chance of frost. And they uh, if they get up too high and we get a big frost, it'll hurt the leaves, of course. The one issue you have to watch is, is vole damage. And last year we lost a hundred of our hosses because we had a severe vole damage where doing something a little different this year, we hope, to take care of it. So far, we've seen no evidence of them. Spring, you come out, I, we check them in the garage. You, you need about uh, February, you need to check and be sure the ground is not too dry, but you don't want to give them a lot of water. Some, some guys bring snow. If you happen to have had snow, they'll bring some snow in, parts of ice cubes, and lay on them so they get a little moisture. I just give them a little, a little drip of water on all of them to be sure they still have moisture. Uh, as a, as a, the season warms up or the garage warms up, you have to watch. Uh, we have had uh, uh, springs where we've got up to 55 and 60 in the garage, and we have some of the bigger pots we had in there, we got looking at them, and 
they were already up three and four inches. They were white. Uh, they ended up going in the living room next to the big windows. We put plastic down and we, we grew hostas in the living room for a while. But uh, once they start, um, you got to get them to some place that, uh, that they'll uh, be able to come up. And by April, generally just get everything uncovered. These are two of the uh, time release that we use on the uh, NutriCoat is on the right hand side. That's available out at, at uh, Align IFS. She has it in some 25 pound or 90 pound bags. Uh, we get the big bag. Uh, unfortunately, the big bag is right around $100, but it will last us for about six years. Or Osmocote, any time released, put in around the, uh, around the pot. I'm going to get into, um, did anybody have questions on so far of pots and uh, what to do, what not to do? Do I want to get into some of the diseases and some of the other issues that, we've, that we find? Because that's, these are some of the things I get asked a lot, out, like out the RDA garden. So I want to cover some of those. Yeah. Why do you leave some in the plastic pots and put them inside a pot as opposed to planting them in the pot? Is it just for variety? Uh, she wanted to know why I, why I put some in the plastic nursery pot and then into another pot. Kind of for convenience because I want to be able to winter them over. Um, and so by taking that black nursery pot out, I then move it to our storage area or I dig a hole in the ground and bury it. Uh, and that will keep the clay pot from freezing. Uh, I'll take all the all the soil and everything out of that clay pot to keep it from freezing. Uh, I have two of them in the front yard. Uh, the pots, if this is the ground, the pots stand about that tall. Um, every year I, I put a, a black nursery pot in one of them. And then in the fall when I take that out, I just actually dig a hole in the, in the garden right next to it, set it in the ground. And the spring is right there, I just take it out and put it back. And people that come up and, and see it, it looks like the hosta is planted in there. So it becomes a convenient thing for winter. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to have to take that clay pot and store it somewhere. And uh, so it helps in the storage. Could you just back up that, to that last slide, Rick? I didn't quite get the, about the NutriCode. And yeah, oh, no, not that one. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Fertilizer. Yeah, this on the right-hand side is NutriCoat or Osmocote. I mean, those are Osmocote is probably more readily available around here from even like Prairie Gardens. Prairie Gardens doesn't carry the uh, NutriCoat. Okay, thank you. And we, you know, we put that on top of our pots, a handful on each one of them uh, in the early spring. And I don't uh, the ones I have in in pots, uh, I use Miracle Grow. Uh, Bob Solberg down in North Carolina uses miracle Grow tomato fertilizer at about a 50% rate, and every time he waters, he fertilizes. Well, he's growing hostas to sell us, so he wants them to come up and really grow well. But it's a good fertilizer, and, uh, and so you can do that. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> this, this is actually in a garden in Urbana that I found about three years ago. We have a we have a disease in the hosta in the hosta world called virus X. Uh, there's about probably 20 different hostas that this shows up in. This is some in substance. Uh, it's very prone to it, and you can see by what's kind of a molted area. A little hard to see in some of those. <clears throat> this disease came from overseas. A lot of the uh, the big box stores buy their product from overseas, from Netherlands and that area. They use a lot of mechanical methods of their of uh, growing and and, com and picking up their hostas for shipment. Uh, and so this <clears throat> this is inherent in this whole plant. Now, what we recommend is if we find it, and we just found another one this summer in one of our friends' yard. Uh, is you destroy it right away because if you go in and you take your tools and you and you cut you cut these leaves off and you go over here to this hosta 
and you cut another leaf off, you just transmitted that disease to it. So as we all say with gardeners, clean your tools. But if we, and, and if you have a hosta in your yard <laughs> that you think might look like that, uh, strip tease is one of them that gets it. We found a strip tease in one of the gardens this past summer. Um, I can't think of some others. There's about, there's about 15 or 20 that is really susceptible in. But if you see one that just looks kind of weird, there is a test kit that we have. And we can come test it to see if you have that disease hosta. And if so, then we recommend you dig it up, put it in the garbage bag, don't put it in the compost, and put it in the garbage so it'll get shipped over to Danville and put in the landfill. <laughs> give, give it to the guys over there. This one is only spread by mechanical means. In other words, you, like I said, you cut that leaf, you go to another one, you cut another one, you've transmitted it. So all of us as gardeners, we all know we treat our tools, right? This is, a, this is a nematode. Nematode is a small little microscopic uh, worm that, that comes up the stem of the plant, comes up to the scape, and then goes up, travels up the vein. And when you begin to see this vein like this, this is a nematode. There is a product now that we're, we're trying in our yards. It's called Nemakill. And it's supposed to, it's been tested by, well, the down in, well, started in the University of Ohio State University, and now it's in Louisville where the tests were done. Um, and this product will kill nematodes in hostas, so we're treating us. We don't, we haven't really found any, but we're doing some treatment to verify that uh, uh, that will take care of. It. There you see some over there. This happens usually in August when it starts getting hot and dry. These start to come up in the leaves. It doesn't really affect the leaf. I mean, it just kind of looks bad. These little guys will move. If you come in here and you do a lot of watering on this plant and the water splashes to the next plant, the little nematode will go over there. And so they are spread by water and, and that way. Uh, in the fall, it's always good then to, once you see these, is to come in and cut all the leaves off. That's the one thing we recommend is in the fall, when your leaves start to die back, cut everything off, get rid of it. Hello? Question yeah. Is it applied over the leaves? It's a, it's a drench that we, we put put it on the ground. Isn't that what we've done? No, you, you just sprinkle the whole plant yes. with it. Yeah. She wanted to know if you put it on the leaves. Yeah, we sprinkle. Barbara's the one that went out and did all the work, so I wasn't, I don't think I was there when it all, but you sprinkle it on the leaves. Uh, Crown rot or, or southern blight is when you begin to see leaves that are starting to die and fall off. Uh, a good fungicide, you need to clean all that off. What I do is I actually dig the plant up, get rid of all the bad leaves, put a lot of fungicide on it, put it in a, in a nursery pot, and move it someplace else. Uh, you probably have a 50-50 chance that it'll live. If you get it early enough, it will probably live. Uh, if you wait until... Uh, uh, until later, it, until most of the leaves are gone, you've probably lost the plant. Um, this is a, uh, you see some of the little slug holes in there. We use a plant, a material called Deadline, uh, Sluggo. There's a lot of them on the market. Um, we were up in Chicago this uh, uh, Saturday. Uh, one of the gals with the, uh, with the state gave a, a presentation on on uh, bugs and slugs and and jumping worms and everything that's that's around the area, and she talked about the beer. Uh, you can put a little tray out there for the little slug to come over and drink beer. We've never found that works. I mean, well, number number two, we have dogs in our yard, so we'll have drunk dogs, you know. So, uh, but we've never found that to work. Uh, when you when you get out at if you if, we go out at 9:30 at night maybe 10 o'clock at night with a spray bottle of 50% ammonia and water. And if you come out and you pull these leaves apart, the little guys are down there climbing up the leaves or coming up for an evening snack. And so you can spray the ammonia water on them and then you get to watch them all curl up and die. But what, what happens is most of your slugs are down in the crown of the plant. 
And so if you come out here and you put all the, some people put the slug bait core out here, they're, they're already over here. And the big guys, the, the big moms and dads that have had all the little babies, uh, they may finally crawl over to another one, but if they got this plant, uh, they're not going anywhere until they devour the whole plant. And we've had some of them that they've just devoured the whole plant. The plant will come up next year, but if you get enough slugs, they'll devour the whole thing. So if you have slug bait, pull the leaves apart, sprinkle it down in the crown of the plant. We did it this past year, and we eliminated about 90% of our slug. Yeah? Rick, the diseases prior to this slide that you were talking about, do any of those stay in the soil? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the nematodes and, uh, yeah. She asked if, if the diseases stay in the soil. Uh, yes. Uh, if, if you have the, uh, the, like the sum and substance, if you have that, you want to get all the root. I mean, you have to dig far enough out to get all the root out there because the root out here still has the, the virus X in it. So thank you. I, I should have brought that up. The nematodes are another thing. I mean, when you have the nematodes out there, they, they could be cut over to the next plant too. So yes. We order ours online. It's not, it's a much stronger product. Um, we, we put it in the crown. This, we put it in the crown of our plant uh, because of our two little dogs. And so it's one thing you have to watch as far as animals are concerned. Uh, and if you put it down in the crown of the plant where the slugs are, I mean, ours pretty well leaves stuff alone. Barbara? Yeah, it's not pet friendly. Yeah. So if you have a dog that's going to get in the middle of the plant, you don't want to use it. Now, if you've got a dog that wants to eat green leaves or something, that's not uh, an eat your hosta. How often do you have to apply it? Uh, in general, about every 30 to 45 days. Uh, and I, I usually don't start until uh, about the end of May, maybe into June, because I wait till the plant gets up. They're not, they're not really active real early on. I mean, they're, all, they're usually coming out of the egg. And I wait till I begin to know that they are getting active. Um, You'll see the slug bait will lay down there, it'll get wet, and it gets kind of a fuzzy look on it too. Don't put a lot. All you just have to do is sprinkle a little bit in and go back in about 30 days and do it again. So sluggo is supposed to be safe for animals and birds. Right. Yeah, yeah I read the label. There's, there's several of them that, that are uh, safer. Our dogs would... <clears throat> so, um, deadline, if, if they eat it, it's it's sour, it's a bad taste, they would probably spit it out. And that's what a lot of that stuff is. It has a very bitter taste to it so that the animal will not eat it. Um, our littlest dog, she doesn't like uh, a, a lot of different things, so I know she would, she would not eat it. Missy probably would, but... Uh, um, if any of you had uh, kind of this kind of damage to your hostas, I mean, that's cutworms and earwigs have been doing that damage. We've had more of it this year than in the past. You see, oops, wait a minute. Wrong set. You see it's, it's eating, it, eating this whole part of the, of the leaf and it's eating this part. Um, seven, the, the spray seems to work pretty good, uh, but unfortunately you have to do it a little more often and you have to spray the underside of the plant because they, they generally come up from the bottom. Um, and of course, out at the Idea Garden, we all have the bowl problem. Uh, we've had it this past year at our house. Uh, this is one method that uh, we use. A friend of ours up in Wisconsin who has roughly five acres of hostas, this was his solution to a bowl problem. You use a canning jar, just a bowl canning jar, cut a bean notch in the lid, a little bit bigger than a quarter, uh, you place a decon or tomcat dry bait in the jar and you lay it out under the hosta leaves or out anywhere in your garden. Now, if you have animals around, uh, I put our jars inside the uh, milk carton. We buy the milk carton crates and I put it in there. I set the crate on top, put a brick on it so our dog won't knock it off. Uh, last year, uh, they went through two uh, one gallon buckets of tomcat. Even though they ate all our houses, they also ate all my tomcat. And they still kept eating. 
Um, but you can, that, that is, does seem to work. Uh, several others have used that. Uh, if you get old canning jars, that's a, that's a good method. <clears throat> Something that, uh, that has just kind of, we, we've stumbled upon in the last year or two is a soil treatment using castor oil. And uh, I don't know if we had the opportunity to get the, the uh, idea garden done this year or not. That was one of, was hopefully one of the plans to, to work on the bowl problem. This is a, this is a formula. Uh, we have sprayed our two areas in our backyard where we store them. Uh, so far, I have seen no evidence of voles. Uh, you only have to spray it one time. I mean, you soak the ground. In fact, we had a kind of a dry fall. I soaked the ground good first with this water, and then we mixed up the solution in a sprayer. Just use a normal garden sprayer. It goes relatively fast when you get out where on about a nearly wide open on the sprayer. Uh, and it took probably eight or nine times. We went through a whole, this whole jug and another one of, of uh, castor oil. Barbara ordered that online. Uh, you have to shake it as you go because oil, the soap is in there to help the water, the, so, the soap is in there for the castor oil to mix with the water. And it doesn't do a real good job, so as you're spraying, you have to shake. Uh, this came from some uh, gardeners up in is it New Hampshire, up in New Hampshire area. They've tried it, and it works. We have a friend in Peoria that has uh, sells hostas online. Uh, Barry has an area probably uh, 150 feet wide by five or six, seven hundred feet long of hostas. Uh, he has sprayed that whole area. He totally has eliminated the voles from eating his hostas, and they all moved over to another spot in his garden and ate the other stuff. <laughs> so, so it worked, but it, uh, now he has to spray his whole yard. So if any of you know uh, uh, Wood and Kathy Daly, they live out near us in the Maynard Lake Edition. They've had a bad, the voles just moved in out there uh, in the past year. So Wood, before they left for Florida in November, uh, they had an area in the backyard of voles and in the front yard. The day before they left for Florida, and of course they're back down there again, you know, we're all, well, whatever. Uh, he went out and he sprayed his whole backyard. He used this formula. In fact, he, he told me, he said, you said two ounces, I did six ounces. <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it real. I, he said, will that hurt? I said, Hell no, it won't hurt. You know, more is better, right? Anything. <laughs> so he sprayed his whole back area behind the house. Uh, back in early December, and then in the front of the house, he didn't get to it. He got that the day before. We took, I took him to the airport at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, to leave to go to Florida. I couldn't go with him. Uh, so he didn't get the front done. So he laid out some of the jar. He had two of the jars in the front yard. Uh, I went over in December, early December, and his jars in the backyard, and he had also got some packets of Tomcat, and he put those around the holes. Nothing had been disturbed. The little packets were still sitting in the hole. Uh, there was no trails through the garden like there had been all last year. I walked around the front yard. There's trails all through their garden. All the bait from the two jars is gone. So we think that this is working. Um, if you have a real problem, um, right now we recommend it. Um, we do have, have we put this on our website? Or not yet? Uh, no, not yet. Barbara, you can ask Barbara later. I mean, she can give you some websites to go to, or you can get this down, or you can email us. So there's a website at the bottom. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. If you can read that, that's uh, that's new. Actually, N H Hostas. That's New Haven Hostas or New Hampshire Hostas. Dot com slash voles dash and dash mice. So this is a repellent. Yeah. What it, it repels them. Apparently, um, I know none of us like castor oil, I guess, and apparently bowls and mice don't like castor oil. <laughs> so um, I've, had, I've had four jars in the backyard in our storage area, actually laying outside the storage area where they used to eat it. I mean, they'd eat it every week. I'd go back and look, the jar's empty. The, the basement in the jar now uh, for 
well, two months. So I changed it out because it gets wet. But so it probably it works. So far, we're keeping our fingers crossed. So to go on a little bit, I've, if there's any, like I said, we'll get into questions when I'm done. Um, if you've not been out to the Hosta Garden at the U of I Arboretum, we are just north of the Japan House. When you're at the Idea Garden, walk due south. Uh, go past the, past the Hartley Garden, go on down, take the walk down to the Japan House, and you'll see our garden. Uh, two years ago, it was dedicated as an American Hosta Society display garden, one of only two in Illinois. Uh, there's another one in Chicago that's in the process. Uh, these are all the various ones that were instrumental in getting the garden uh, started. Uh, here's one of the areas that, that uh, Susan uh, Weber uh, laid out these hostas with a rock in the middle that looked like a pond. So you get all these nice, all these nice blue hostas laid out here. You can make it look like a pond with a rock in it, yeah, an island in it. And you can see we use a lot more edging of some other, some grasses and so on. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be here for the garden walk this year. Barbara and I are both involved in American Hostess Society work. We will be in St. Louis uh, that weekend. Um, we are hosting the annual Midwest Regional Convention here in Champaign, July 7th through the 9th. Um, we will have at least seven uh, vendors at the uh, Hawthorne, and the public is welcome. You guys will all be notified uh, of that event. You're welcome to come down and buy from them. They have a lot of stuff, a lot of hostas. So hosta fever, as I said, where I'm a, I'm a hostaholic. Well, we both are. Uh, permanent labels. My wife does a permanent label. We bring a hosta home from a nursery. Uh, I walk out to the back door. I set it out in the backyard. When I turn around, the, pli the, potty, the plant label is already in it. Oh my well, almost. Um, label, labels in a notebook. Uh, she's guilty of that. She's my hosta buddy. There's our favorite hosta is American Angel, which, was, uh, which came from Van Wade out of Ohio. Uh, we, we vacation around hostas. We're guilty of that. <laughs> they do not invade my dreams. <laughs> yet. Mice invade our collection. Well, two different kinds of mice. The ones you saw, the green ones, and then we have had the little four-legged mice have invaded sometimes. Uh, we formed the hosta group. Do we spend more money on a hosta? Well, <coughs> I will say this when you... When you spend $100 on a hosta, it will probably die. <laughs> We've, there, is, there is one hosta that's on the market right now called Humpback Whale. And it's a large green hosta uh, that was hybridized by uh, Mildred Seaver out in New Jersey. In 2006, her son brought the original plant. There was only one. She had one plant. He brought the original plant to the auction uh, in Philadelphia. And Diane was there when we were there. Uh, they, we have an auction every year for auctioning off hostas. And they go for a lot of money. That hosta sold for $3,700. The woman that bought it was a friend of hers. And there was, a, there was a guy bidding against her who was a hybridizer, and he wanted it. She didn't want him to have it, and so this <laughs> bidding just kept going back and forth and back and forth. It's in the market now. She got all of her money back, but um, yeah, we have spent more than we should. And it didn't die. <laughs> yeah, it didn't, yeah, it didn't die. Um, we try and affect other people. That's what we've done here tonight. Uh, we lost it after some. Yeah, we do that. Uh, we grow from seeds, and we were able to, with another, with Olga Patrizan, name one of the hostas a champagne taste. Uh, it's a hosta that we acquired from her um, back in 2009. Uh, she had a big sale. She didn't, it was ones that she didn't want. I saw it. I thought it was neat. We dug it up and brought it home. It's a real slow grower. We bought it. It was that big around. It's still about this big around, but it's a beautiful hosta. Uh, we won a seedling 
contest with it uh, down in Nashville, Tennessee. And she ended up naming, between us and, and she, we named it. So she has one and we have one. So it's not on the market. You will never see it on the market uh, just because it doesn't grow real fast. So the buyer beware. One word of caution. Many casual hostile users <laughs> thought they could stop whenever they wanted. <laughs> what begins as an innocent interest can develop into full-blown addiction. You are routinely tell your spouse you paid less than you really did for a new introduction. Oh, boy. And <laughs> yes. Um, or you brag about all the hostile cultivars you have cultivars you have in your garden, you may need help. At any convention, you meet a lot of great people. And we have a lot of fun at them. Yeah, we've, we've spent more for hostas than we probably should, and I've bid on more than I probably should, and she will tell you that, and, uh, but that's the way life is. <laughs> any more, any questions, Fran? So I hope you... You are rich, thank you. They're pretty 50-50. <laughs> on what? Why you... Who's the bigger hostaholic? Yeah, I don't know. It, it depends. Uh, I like blues. She likes minis. Uh, I like blues and yellows, you know, so you'll see blues in our places. I like them. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we do it. Tell them about the neat t-shirt you have. About what? Tell them about the neat t-shirt you have, the one that says I spent all my money on oh, Yeah, I, several years ago I made up a I went to uh, we went to one of the train museums down in California, and I bought the T-shirt. Said I uh, I spent all my money on trains. The rest of it I just wasted. And um, my basement's kind of that way. Uh, so I made one up for hostas, and I said uh, same thing. I spent all my money on hostas, and the rest of it we've just wasted. So yeah, the time and money. Yeah, time and money. Yes. Almost whenever you want to, but at least let them grow out to three or four years before you do. A second thing is that I didn't show you here, uh, hostas will what they call ferry out. Uh, you know, some plants will get the ferry ring in the middle because they will grow outward and the middle will begin to die out and especially in the spring. You go out in the spring and look and all the little, all the little pips are coming up in a circle and the middle has nothing in it. That's the time to divide it. And as we, as we noted at the start of this, the hosta is the friendship plant. So dig it up, give it to your friend, split it, put two parts of it back in, and give two parts of it away. Um, or as we do, we sell them. We have a plant sale every year with the, the stuff I dig up. We'll have one in May again. Uh, we do that. Uh, that <laughs> I mean, we have to feed our our requirement of buying hostas, so we have to, we, now we have to feed it some way, but you want to wait at least at least three years, maybe four years uh, to do that, or uh, we've got uh, we got some in the backyard have been there, they were planted there in 2003, and they've never been dug up, and they're they're already this big, and it's one of those I, I always hate to. Sometimes you'll find that um, the, the digging up and moving a hosta and replanting it uh, it'll put it in shock. You know, it's like a lot of other plants we do, and it will not do real well for two or three years. It will finally come back, but if it's two or three years, they won't do well. In fact, I've had a couple of them that just up and died. I dug them up and I gave them, we gave a couple of them to the dailies, and, my, and ours died, and theirs is doing good, you know, so now I'm gonna have to go back and dig it out of their yard. <laughs> yeah. Did you say you cut all those back every fall? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, because you have nematodes and you have other stuff in there and all it does is let any any disease or bug or whatever's in it. I mean, it's like we go to the idea garden, you know, we clean up the idea garden, do same thing. We, In fact, we start cutting our leaves off when um, some are still green. I mean, they may be turning yellow and so on. We'll cut a lot of those off early. We got about 350 to 400 hostas in the yard. And so it takes a while to get rid of it. but. Clean it up in the fall, get back down to bare, bare earth in there. Even use a lawnmower if you don't have any. Yeah. yeah, you can run the, a friend of mine, uh, one of my train friends over in Ohio, he, or in Indiana over here at Otterbein, he, uh, he goes out and mows them off with a lawnmower. So, 
His wife is not real, not real happy because one time he mowed them off, they are all still green. So. Uh -oh. Then again, Whoops. you'd be spreading the virus X. Yeah. Well, if you, you know, yeah, the virus X issue, like I say, if you, if you find a hosta in your yard that looks different than what it ought to, I mean, most hostas are, have a good pattern to them. If something looks molted like I showed you that one. You get a hold of us. We'll come out and look at it. Diane will come out and look at it. I mean, she knows them. We'll come out and take a look at it. Marianne Metz. Um, and if we think it's a possible disease hostile, we can run a test on it. And if it is, we'll recommend you dig it out of the yard. Uh, that one I showed you in Urbana, she dug that out um, later. We had another one we found on the garden walk here. That was probably in 09. One of the families had one that was uh, not part of our group. And we told them about it, and it was off by itself. And they said, well, we kind of like it. We said, well, <laughs> um, we understand that, but do not give it to anybody. You know, and don't. And they said, well, we're going to leave it. Well, I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. But, uh, and we have found them in nurseries around here. But the nurseries here now know what it looks like, and they are really on to staying away. But don't buy them at the big box stores. That's where you get them. <clears throat> And sometimes the plant doesn't show up when you first buy it. You might have it five years and all of a sudden it shows yeah. up in the plant. <laughs> yeah, the one that we found this summer, the sub and substance, she'd had that for a couple of years. This year it showed up. So, uh, and she couldn't remember where she bought it, but she thought maybe at Lowe's. And uh, that's where those guys get that stuff. It all comes over from overseas. And uh, as we know, a lot of other diseases that come in, that's what you have to watch. Yeah. Grow some of your hostas from seed. Can you kind of explain that? Is it <laughs> or is that like legal? It's just like uh, like you're growing them out here at the greenhouse. We uh, um, you take the, you, some people cut the seed pot, the flowers off right away. There's there's people that like flowers. There's people that hate flowers on a hosta. Some of them, as soon as they come up, they whack that off. Uh, we like the flowers. When the seed pods come, we leave them on, and they start to dry up. Uh, if Barbara will pick ones that maybe she has crossed, because she's done some crossing from one to the other. Uh, she's working to try and get some different kind of looking hostas. Uh, this year, we just kept them from, what, probably eight different hostas, I guess, eight or nine, something like that. You take them apart, they're in a, the seeds have a, uh, like a little wing on them. Most of them are, between a quarter and a half inch long. The little seed head is in the one end of it. Um, I, I plant those on Thanksgiving weekend under lights. I mean, it, just like any seeds, within about two weeks they start coming up and now they're all up about uh, two, two and a half inches above the pots and I, I plant them in trays. Uh, we have a friend up in uh, uh, Wisconsin. He plants about 500,000 every year. Uh, a friend of ours in Ohio, he does about twenty to twenty-five thousand. We do about five hundred, just for the fun. We're just over the fun of it. But it's just neat to get something. They get a lot of them come up street. You will get yellow ones. You get some blues. We have quite a few street ones come up this year. And a lot of them are just green. They'll just get pulled up, thrown away. I'll just throw them away. Hard to do. <laughs> you know, it's like your little babies. You know, you grew them. And it's like... <clears throat> but that's yeah, a lot of fun. We've done it. We've done it almost every year. We grow some. Yeah. Have you ever eaten any of the flowers? No. <laughs> Has anybody? Uh, you can you you can do that on some of them. I understand the way you make salads or something. The, the, uh -huh. the, I don't know about the flowers, but the Japanese have eaten the leaves. Yeah. As, like a, as a salad. Yeah. And there's a dip you can make with pasta leaves. One of our friends has made that. We yeah, have not really. tried it. <laughs> I've heard about the flowers. Yeah, I don't uh, know. I've heard the about flowers. So. I don't intend to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hosta leaves make real nice additions in uh, bouquets, like yeah. you like yeah. to uh, yeah. plant stuff. They're really great. Well, part of our yeah. part of our Hosta program that we when we go to these conventions, so they have leaf shows, yes. and you you, know, you put the leaves in a leaf show. A Hosta leaf will last. Oh, six, seven days in pretty good shape. I mean, you take a leaf from any other plant out here in the idea garden, and most of them, within a day, they're, you know, they're gone. 
And uh, I mean, we take leaves from our yard to go to a convention, and we pick, she'll get them the day before we leave, and they go down there, and they're, we'll put them in water, and they sit there then on the table until Saturday, and so they're, they're at least five days, and they look just as good at the end of five days as they did when we put them in. Like Diane said, they really make a nice decoration in, in table decorations with other flowers and so on. They make they're really nice, and so, but they last a long time. That's, that's one nice thing about them. Well, thank you. Hasta la vista. Oh. <laughs>